couple of days a week with um, Broadband Delivery UK service. This is the white ball end of the program you've just heard about, if you like. My specific role is looking at um, communities in the most hard to reach areas and finding super, um, super fast solutions for what's called the final 10%. And I'll go through all of the sort of background of what we're trying to do and what that means in a moment. Um, sort of big picture stuff. Um, Jeremy Hunt, Minister, uh, has said that the UK is to have the best super fast broadband market in Europe by 2015. Um, what that translates into is that um, the policy says we should have 90% of the UK population able to receive at least 24 and ideally at least 30 megabits and that absolutely everybody should have access to at least 2 megabits. Now, what that at least 2 megabits specifically is on the ground, um, rather than being an aspiration of creeping into the 2 meg, I think most counties would be trying to get substantially more than that. Um, so it's, it's not one group has 30, one group has 2, and never, never the twain sort of thing. The aim is to get everybody as clustered into good broadband as possible, I think. The market's going to deliver around 70% of the UK population anyway, so that's predominantly BT virgins and so on. Um, so the policy is really to get from 70 to 90, uh, is the, the broad brush stroke of it. The government's putting 530 million pounds in, but I think sometimes the message gets slightly lost. <coughs> that people say, well, that's not actually an awful lot of money in telecommunications terms, but that money is being matched by every local authority in England and every devolved assembly, and then all of that is being matched by industry as well, and actually the sum total comes to, if you add in the industry and public sector funding, it's likely to be over two billion pounds. So it's, it is actually a pretty chunky investment. The thing that um, I've come predominantly to talk about though is those communities that are in the final 10%. Um, DEFRA and BDUK together have launched a, a £20 million fund for communities that live in that final 10% area that you know, will be offered some sort of better broadband, but if they root what they really want and they can justify themselves. Um, 30 megabits or better, then they can apply into this fund. Um, now, I'll talk through all of this. It's, it's, not any, you know, it's not something to take on lightly, and I do want to emphasize that your broadband is going to get better anyway. This is really for people who, who absolutely want super fast broadband in those very more, the, the most rural areas. We have already had a first round of this. Um, that closed um, a couple of months ago. And we had um, express 16 expressions of interest from around the country that were endorsed that are moving now building a, a full bid, covering about 33,000 premises. Um, quite a large number of those will be fibre to the home projects, actually digging fibre into the, the, the most rural areas. So technically, what you tend to find, and other people will be speaking about this later, the main industry uses a technology called fibre to the cabinet, as we hear, it sort of takes, puts a fibre between the BT telephone exchange and the green cabinet at the end of your road, and puts the electronics there. That works brilliantly if you have a cabinet between you and the telephone exchange, and that the, cab the cabinet is not too far from your house. In the most rural areas, it's not unusual for neither of those things to be true. So fibre to the cabinet tends not to work too well in the very most rural areas. As a result, from an engineering perspective, if you want to get very fast broadband out, you either have to consider digging fibre all the way to the home, or in some circumstances you may be able to use a wireless technology. Um, so it's a very different solution than the industry is used to, and this fund is to try and help support those kinds of projects. As we just heard, the fund is now open. It opened on the 10th of May. Um, it closes again on the 6th of July. Now, this isn't the sort of fund that you can sit there on the 5th of July and pull down the forms and start filling them in. 
if you're serious about wanting to apply, you really not need to start thinking about it now. One of the key things that takes time is that you need to be able to show that you've got your community with you, uh, that you're not some sort of flag-waving campaigner in a village that's all actually all on their own. You, so you've got to do a proper demand assessment within your community, and that can take quite a chunk of time. So if you're thinking of applying, start thinking of doing that now. The other thing to bear in mind is that this fund is a fully competitive fund. So no funds are actually earmarked, green fence, taken out of the fund until there's a formal funding contract in there. So the longer you take to apply, the bigger the risk is that the money will have already gone. Something that's common to all of this programme is that no one constituency is able to fix the broadband problem on their own. Industry can reach about 70% of their own money using traditional approaches, <coughs> but struggles to get out towards any much higher than that using traditional approaches. The public sector, unless you live in somewhere like South Korea, finds it very difficult to do anything much about it on their own, so they need to engage with industry properly. But actually, neither just industry and the public sector working <coughs> together you can't do this without the communities getting engaged as well. So the Community Broadband Fund is really to try and extend that community engagement, uh, maybe bringing different parts of the, the telecommunications industry, um, linking with the public sector and everybody to try and find solutions. So a proposal that you put in should in some way reflect that sort of balancing of different parts of the industry parts of the public sector and so on. And you should also try and show that you've got a majority of the premises in the area that you want to cover um, supporting, um, supporting your project. Just from a commercial sustainability point of view, if, you, if you're covering an area that has a thousand households in it and only ten of them actually want it, you're not going to make this stack up as a business, however hard you try. Who can apply? It needs, eventually, to be a legally constituted organisation. Um, it doesn't need to be legally constituted when you make the initial application, but you have to have it registered in whatever form that takes before you can sign a contract with DEFRA to draw the money down. It also, you need to be prepared for that company, whatever model you choose, however engaged you feel you're going to be in this project, you need for that company to be around for at least five years because the European auditors and so on will want information about how your fund has been spent for the next five years. So even if your intention is to shovel it off to um, some provider, your company, your legally constituted body, will still be responsible for that money for the next five years. So the sorts of people who can apply, um, community enterprises, so traditional co-ops, companies limited by guarantee, community interest companies, Bencoms, that sort of thing. Could be one specially registered just for this purpose. Could be one that you've already got working within your community. That's up to you. A lot of charities can. If the charity permits trading and all those sorts of things within the scope of your current charter. Local authorities can apply at all levels. I think in an early form of the presentation it actually didn't mention parish councils, but parish councils absolutely can apply. But they have to be able to demonstrate that they weren't just fishing for a top up of funding, that they actually have got communities actually involved in all of this and it's, it looks like a community project. Um, one of the things that went on with the first round was a number of local authorities did apply, but weren't able to show that they've got their communities fully engaged in all of this. And their demonstration of demand was a fairly bland survey that said, we want better broadband. Well, the county plan's going to be delivering better broadband anyway. This is about super fast broadband from within the community. They needed to go out and demonstrate that. Also, other local partnerships. There may be chambers of commerce, um, local uh, business organisations, collections of businesses, that sort of thing, could also 
uh, apply. Now, under the rules, what's called a communications provider can't apply. So, for example, BT couldn't apply in their own right. It can't be someone who's actually going to be a beneficiary who's going to profit from the service themselves. It has to be a community organisation or somebody reflecting that community. It's super fast broadband only. So again, anybody who's thinking of being able to deliver thinks that 8, 10, 12, 15 megabits might be good enough. That's not within the scope of this fund. You've got to get 20, you've got, you've got to want at least 24 and ideally at least 30 megabits um, to qualify for this fund. And the idea is that it extends the local broadband plan we've already heard about beyond the 90% and getting as close to the 100% as we can reasonably make it. It also needs to deliver what we're calling um, strategic national infrastructure. So at some point in the future, uh, there will be uh, a copper network switch off. BT's copper network at some point, some way in the future, will be turned on. And whatever network gets built today will be the one that gets left as the default network. And that changes the mindset of how you approach these projects a little. You're, you know, when you're building an overlay network, when someone else is, you know, someone else is always there to catch it if you if you decide you've had enough. It's a very different approach than realizing that you are, or you will eventually become the safety net. So it's not for temporary solutions that just prove that you've got better demand or that you want a service slightly earlier. This is likely to deliver the solution that's going to stay there for the rest of our lives anyway. The fund is technology neutral. We don't care within some what the solution looks like as long as it delivers that 24 to 30 megabits. It could be five, it could be one, it could be a number of things. Um, interestingly, under European rules, the one thing it can't be is satellite. Satellite is considered a, a basic broadband technology and therefore not a super fast technology. It has too many other um, problems with it to be considered a true super fast permanent long term solution to internet. It's a good solution at getting you past um, a temporary problem. It's also a good solution if you really are right in the outer Hebrides or somewhere. But from a, you know, as a mainstream solution, I think it doesn't really count. And it has to adhere to industry standards. Again, because you're going to become the strategic national infrastructure for your community, you need to, you need to behave and look like the industry. So throwing cables over farm fences and in trees and things isn't really allowed. Where and how much? Um, the first thing is that a full application will need a proper old-fashioned business plan. The, 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 the full application actually looks much less like a traditional grant funding process and much more like an interview with a bank manager. Um, it is an old-fashioned business plan that you will eventually need with balance sheets and all those sorts of things rather than lots of forms that tick, you have to fill tick boxes. It has to be in the hardest to reach areas. Now, knowing quite exactly where that is isn't an exact science. Um, you know, the county council here <coughs> isn't going to know for sure what are their hardest to reach areas until someone's delivered the easiest to reach areas. Um, but there are models that both the council and actually communities can start using that start giving actually a very good estimate of where those areas are likely to be. What I've shown there is Hampshire, um, Hampshire Council have been one of the ones that have been leading this process and have been producing very good maps for their communities that identify pretty accurately where they believe at this moment their project, their main project is likely to deliver and therefore which communities are at risk of being outside of that and might want to consider bidding into this fund. Um, are you trying to do anything like that in Cheshire? We're putting you on the spot? Well, we've got similar mapping uh, for the 9-10%, for but with that European funding it adds a different dimension, so if we're successful yeah. with that, the, the money goes further. So we've got, we've got mapping <coughs> that we'll be sharing through the uh, public consultation. Great. Um, in terms of the funding <coughs> itself, um, 
It's up to £300 per premise the grant will support, but it has to be at least matched by private funds. So it's not one of these grants where you can apply for two grants and match them against each other. This is one of these ones where you actually have to match it against private money. Now that could be money from a variety of different sources. I mean, it could be your own investment, it could be a supplier investment, all sorts of things. Um, but, um, it does need to be matched. Uh, what we found in round one, which was, was interesting, was that um, the community enterprise-led projects were typically matching the funding three to one. So for <coughs> every £300 that the public sector was going to invest in these projects, communities were looking to invest <coughs> typically £900 to £1,000. Um, so it's, from a public sector point of view, actually remarkably good backing. What sorts of things you can use as uh, match funding, just to sort of give you some ideas. Um, connection charges can actually be used. Um, so if you're, you know, it's not unusual to spend perhaps £100 installation fee or more on a project of this type. That money can be used as part of your match funding. Community chair offers, <coughs> I suspect, are you going to mention your <coughs> You'll probably hear about community share offers very shortly, but that's actually becoming quite um, an, an increasingly popular way of raising money. Um, you can also use um, those committing to receive a service for a minimum period. So a little bit like people sign up with their mobile phone contracts for you know, perhaps two years now. If you can get people to sign a contract, you may be able to use the value of that <coughs> as part of your batch funding. You may also find you can use that to leverage um, finance from some more enlightened banks. Maybe. <laughs> um, it certainly happens in Europe, that's the way it's not a lot of these projects are funded. Yeah, the Spanish. I heard the Greeks are quite good. <laughs> um, you may find that you can find somebody within the industry that's prepared to co invest alongside you. So when you go out to procurement, you can make it a condition that they invest a certain amount of money. Some sort of traditional um, community funding approaches, family trusts, that sort of thing, may also be able to have money available for this. However, what we found when we were digging around was that there may be quite small amounts of money available, but that's likely to dry up quite quickly if the review, for example, decided to apply for this fund. Big society capital. Um, they're starting to get interesting. From BDUK's point of view, I've started to have some conversations with them, and they are interested in this space. This was launched.